New Zealand, 1965. The radio airwaves were monopolized by the conservative sound of the New Zealand Broadcasting Corporation. NZBC was totally controlled by the government. Um, and like most government departments, it stifled creativity. I can recall the station that I was on, we had a, uh, this was in the very early 60s, early to mid 60s, we weren't, there were times when we weren't allowed to play the Beatles, and the, the Beatles were number one around the world. In my view, they tended to sort of want to stamp on you and uh, put you back into their, into their mould. So, uh, no, it was very boring. However, a radio revolution was about to rock the boat. Radio power key. Top of the dial. Yeah. Frustrated with a limited choice on New Zealand radio, a young Wellington journalist dreamed of breaking the system. The thing that motivated me to get into the pirate radio more than anything else was uh, the distaste I had for horse racing. Um, I grew up in an era where there was only one major radio station in each town throughout New Zealand, that was the ZB stations, which still exist. And uh, they had a lot of horse racing on them, and I can remember right from the time I was a little chap, I hated horse racing with a passion. Um, the other factor was there was virtually no music on commercial radio at the time, on any sort of radio. And at the same time, the, the pirate radio stations were causing a bit of a stir in Britain and making the news and put the three things together and uh, the idea for a pirate radio station came up. There was no chance of obtaining a land-based license. Transmitting from a pirate radio ship was the only solution. To put the plan into action, Gapes and his wife decided to move to Auckland. One of the first things we did was get hold of a survey map of the Hauraki Gulf, and it became apparent that there was a, a window, a three-mile window, because New Zealand at the time had a three-mile limit. By tracing a line around Great Barrier Island, the Hauraki Gulf and the Coromandel Peninsula, a triangle of international water was found. This position was outside the jurisdiction of the New Zealand government. Estimated costs for the project ranged from 100,000 to 400,000 pounds. Although Gates saved hard, he only had 2,000 pounds when he arrived in Auckland. Looking back at it, it was daunting, but at, but at the time we, we were pretty fired up with the idea by this stage and money seemed to be the least of the problems. The next step was to find technical equipment. Gapes wrote to a friend, Dennis O'Callaghan. The letter from Dave came and uh, was a bit of a bolt from the blue, but uh, I like a challenge and uh, it looked like a challenge to me. Uh, so I, um, I wrote back to him uh, and uh, told him I thought he was crazy, but it was interesting. The thing would never have got off the ground without Dennis because um, he was the technical genius and as I said he had a uh, good knowledge of ships so put the two together and and he had the very skills that we needed. Planning began. O'Callaghan devised a system of pre-recording tapes on land for transmission from the ship. Gapes began contacting potential backers. Dave and I uh, we thought we were uh, working in secret and um, but the, uh, the, the rumour was starting to get around because we were contacting advertising agencies and backers and so on. By strange coincidence, two former NZBC employees, Derek Lowe and Chris Parkinson, were working on a similar scheme. We immediately knew we had to uh, suss them out. Um, we, I mean, mainly to see whether or not they were for real. Um, and we also didn't want them to queer our pitch. But once we made contact with them, we very quickly realised that they... Uh, um, they were serious. So we got our, gathered our bits and pieces together, went over there and we were fairly cautious, you know, just exploring what each other was up to and Dave wanted to know what we'd done and we wanted to know how much he'd done. Yeah, it was a pretty tense meeting when we first met, yeah. We were pretty, everyone was pretty defensive and uh, playing their cards very close to the chest. Derek and Chris brought the skills to the, to the deal that we didn't have. I knew nothing about advertising, I knew nothing about radio. Um, Dennis knew a fair bit about radio, but technically. 
So on the commercial side of it, we had nothing. We decided to pool our resources. And looking back on it, uh, I don't think that uh, we could have had a better team. A demonstration tape of what the station would sound like was recorded. The distinctive sound of Radio Haraki was born. It's the most talked about radio, 1480. Fantastic tape, it was really exciting. Derek was able to bring all the frustrations of years working for Radio New Zealand, or as it was then, NZBC. He was able to bring all that frustration to bear on this one creative effort with lots of music in it and hypey voices and go, 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 you know. And I must admit, it sounded fantastic and it galvanised everybody that, that we played it to. It really worked. We'd get down depressed occasionally, we'd come back to the tape and have a listen to it, and we'd get bolstered up again by hearing it. Come on and do the blue beat, blue beat, and you'll never be blue. Whoa. They played the tape to advertisers up and down New Zealand. It was critical that we got the money because we just didn't have it. Um, and we'd, we had, we had, we tried it, we'd knocked on all the doors of all of all the people that we thought had money and they, and they all gave us a good hearing and they all said no. Um, and we tried two or three companies and they all said no. In desperation, Lowe approached Europa Oil. They seemed interested, which was a lot more than the others had. And the meeting went on for a couple of hours and they just said they would come back to us. It was an incredible risk they took. We didn't think so at the time, but looking at it now, it obviously was. I mean, can you imagine getting money out of people in advance for a really harebrained scheme? Not easy, you know. Now, with financial backing, the technical setup could begin. We bought a, an old uh, World War II communications transmitter, um, which a guy had had uh, stashed in his shed out at Ellerslie, and we used that as the basis to, um, to build the transmitter. He scoured the country for bits and pieces and virtually built a transmitter from the ground up. We built it somewhat in secret because uh, we'd been told in no uncertain terms by the post office that uh, what we were doing was illegal. Jack Scott, Minister of Broadcasting, Minister of Marine and Postmaster General, was central to the debate. However, the civil servants of the NZBC were less than enthusiastic. Probably privately, most of them were supportive. Certainly, uh, Jack Scott was, privately uh, and behind the scenes, but officially he wasn't. Officially, he had to toe the party line. The onshore work was gathering momentum but the pirates desperately needed a ship. The Terry was just a wreck. Um, it looked like it belonged in the knacker's yard. Um, it, should, it looked as though it, should never, it would never go to sea again. Uh, it was just a, a rusting, um, smelly, oily, grotty, old ship. It was an absolute pigsty, yeah. I mean, it was just... Devastated, really, when we first heard about it. But no, you, you took it in your stride. You had to go ahead and cope with it because that's what we did all the way along. The growing band of Haraki supporters began the mammoth task of outfitting the Tiri. To comply with Marine Department regulations, she would have to obtain a survey certificate. Everyone mucked in and did it. There wasn't any exception. No one missed out. I mean, one of the hardest workers, I guess, was, was Dave. Dave Gapes. I mean, he got just as dirty and put on boiler suits as everyone else. There wasn't any class distinction um, at any stage, as far as the as far as Haraki was concerned. We didn't make any exceptions. That was a, a very unifying thing. Everybody felt they were working in the same direction. Everybody got the same money or lack of money, and everybody got their hands dirty. Um, everybody's got skills that they can put to use and on occasions like that, and we had disc jockeys, welding torches, scrubbing builders, nailing, painting. And uh, it was a bit like uh, uh, the labours of Hercules. As soon as we fixed one part of the boat up, they'd come down and have an inspection to find something else that had to be fixed up. So that was pretty uh, frustrating. What the pirates didn't know was that the Marine Department had been ordered to delay the inspection survey for as long as possible. Terry was towed to the Viaduct Basin, 
The sight of her scruffy crew working on board gave the Auckland public evidence that Radio Haraki meant business. Just being able to do something after a long period of planning was a pretty fantastic feeling. Yes, the period leading up to when we eventually sailed was a real buzz. There was an immense build-up and a lot of excitement, particularly in the Auckland region, but we learned through letters and phone calls that uh, that interest and excitement was right up and down the whole country. It, it, this, this challenge was about to happen. It was great. <laughs> Sounds of the swinging 16s. I'm one for eight.